The Great Awakening in M41. In the 41st millennium, the long dormant Necrons have finally awoken from their great sleep to begin their conquest of the galaxy once more. In many cases, their tomb worlds had been resettled by the unsuspecting humans of the Imperium, leading to horrific scenes of devastation as the newly awakened Necrons cleansed whole planets of their populations of fragile human souls. The reason for the Necrons awakening from in the 41st millennium is debated amongst the Magi of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Possible catalysts include the approach of the Tyranid Hive Mind's Shadow in the Warp, or an Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator fleet that disturbed one of the Necron Tomb Worlds, though the Major contact between the Imperium and them came in 963 M41 during the conflict between the Ultramarines chapter and the Tau over control of what turned out to be the tomb world of Malbid. In that instance, the Ultramarines chapter master Manir Skalgar ordered the use of an exterminatus against Malbid after allowing the Tau forces to get off planet to eliminate the much greater Necron threat. But they soon began awakening on their tomb worlds all across the galaxy after this event. Regardless of the reason for their awakening, the Necrons proceeded to reap havoc amongst all the peoples of the galaxy. None can say for sure how many tomb worlds enter the Great Sleep some 60 million standard years ago. But it is certain that a great many did not survive into the 41st millennium. Technologically advanced though they were, to attempt a stasis sleep of such a scale was a great risk, even for them. For 60 million Terran years they slept, voicelessly waiting for their chance to complete the Silent King's final order, to restore their dynasties to their former glory. As the centuries passed, ever more tomb worlds fell prey to malfunction or ill fortune. For many, the results were minor, such as a disruption to the operation of the tomb world's chronostat or revivification chambers, causing the inhabitants to awaken later than intended. But some of the tomb worlds suffered more calamitous events. Cascade failures of stasis scripts destroyed millions, if not billions, of Dorman Necrons. Some tomb worlds were destroyed by the retribution of marauding Eldari, their defense systems overmatched by these ancient enemies. Other worlds fell victim to the uncaring evolution of the galaxy itself. Tectonically unstable planets crushed their strongholds, slumbering at their hearts. Stars went supernova, consuming orbiting worlds in their death throes. And everywhere, inquisitive life forms scrabbled and fought over the bones of Necron territories causing more damage in their unthinking search for knowledge than the vengeful Eldari ever could. The Great Awakening has been far from precise, and the Necrons have not arisen as one people, but in fitful starts over scattered millennia like some gestalt sleeper rising from a troubled dream. 
errors in circuitry and protocols ensured that a revivification destined to take place in the early years of the 41st millennium of the original Imperial calendar actually began far earlier in a few cases, or has yet to occur at all in others. The very first tomb worlds revived to see the great crusade of the Emperor of Mankind sweep across the galaxy in the late 30th millennium. A handful stirred in time to see the Nova Terra Interregnum, when Nova Terra challenged the might of the Golden Throne in the 34th millennium for 900 standard years, or arose at the hour in which the apostles of the blind king waved their terrible wars that began in 550 M37. Some have still never awoken, even now, in the era Indomitus. Billions of Necrons still slumber in their stasis tombs, silently awaiting the clarion call of destiny. It is rare for a tomb world to awaken to full function swiftly. With but the slightest flaw in the revivification cycle, the engrammatic pathways of a Necron sleeper scatter and degrade. In most cases, these coalesce over time to restore identity and purpose, but it is a process that can take solar decades, or even standard centuries, and cannot be hurried. Sometimes recovery never occurs, and the sleeper is doomed forever to a mindless state. There are thousands of worlds scattered throughout the galaxy whose halls are thronged with shambling automatons, necrons whose minds fled during the long hibernation, and whose bodies have been co-opted by their world's master atomic program in an attempt to bring some form of order to their existence. Others refer to such places as the Severed Worlds, and they loathe and fear their inhabitants in equal measure. None of this is to say that even an individual lucky enough to achieve a flawless revivification awakens alert and aware. One of the hidden tyrannies of Necron Biotransference was how it entrenched the gulf between the rulers and the ruled, for there were not enough resources to provide all Necronte with living metal bodies that possessed the density of engrammatic pathways required to retain the full gamut of personality and awareness. Thus, as was ever the case, the very finest Necrodermis bodies when to those individuals of the highest rank within the Krontir society, the Pharaohs and Overlords, their Cryptex and Nemesaurs. For the professional soldiery, the merely adequate was deemed appropriate. As for the commoners, they receive that which remains comparatively crude mechanical bodies that were little more than lobotomized prisons for their minds. Numb to all joy and experience, they are bound solely to the will of their betters, their function meaningless without constant direction. Yet even here, a tiny spark of self-awareness remains, enough only to torment the afflicted Necron with memories and echoes of the past it once knew. For these tortured creatures, death would be far preferable. But alas, they no longer have the wit to realize it, or the autonomy to search it out. A tomb world is at its most vulnerable 
during the revivification process. The colossal amounts of energy generated are detectable across great distances and are an irresistible lure to the inquisitive and acquisitive alike. In these early stages, it is unlikely that the army of a tomb world proper will have awoken to full function, so defense lies in the hands of the Necron's robotic servitor constructs, the Canoptech spiders, scarabs, and rays. Initially, these defenders will be directed by the world's autonomic master program, whose complex algorithmic decision matrix allows it to calculate an efficient response to any perceived threat. As the threat level rises, so too does the intensity of the master program's countermeasures, prioritizing the activation of the two worlds' automated defenses and the revification of its armies according to the needs of the situation at hand. If all goes well, the master program's actions will be sufficient to drive out the invader, or at least stall their progress until the first Necron legions have awoken at which point the master program surrenders command of the facility to the world's Necron nobility. Now, when a large population centered of a younger species of the galaxy has evolved or expanded across the stars close to a tomb world, the encoded programming delves deep into its data archives and armories in order to conduct an aggressive defense. Such tomb worlds are the ones that have expanded their spheres of influence most rapidly, for its rulers have awakened to find their full military might already mobilized and awaiting their commands. Indeed, the speed with which many of these worlds of the Saotech dynasty have recovered lost territory is chiefly attributable to the ultimately doomed wave of Alumithi colonies established on their core worlds during the late 39th millennium. To external observers, the behavior of awoken worlds must seem eclectic almost to the point of randomness. Some Necron lords send diplomatic emissaries to other worlds, negotiating for the return of lost territories and technological artifacts, or cast off into the stars, searching for distant tomb worlds not yet awoken. Others focus attention inwards, avoiding unnecessary conflict with alien races to pursue internal politics or oversee the rebuilding of their planet to the glory of 60 million years past. The vast majority of them take a more aggressive tag launching resource raids, planetary invasions, or the full-blown genocidal purges the Necron's former Catan masters once called Red Harvest. Yet even here, it is impossible to predict the precise form these deeds will take. Sometimes the Necrons attack in the full panoply and spectacle of honorable war, rigorously applying their ancient codes of bustle. As others, every possible underhanded tactic is employed, from piracy and deception to assassination and subordination. On other occasions, the campaign is less a martial action than a systematic extermination the swatting of lesser life forms as they themselves would swat insects. All of these acts, diverse though they are in scope and method, are directed towards a single, common goal. The restoration of the Necron dynasties to rule 
over the galaxy. And yet, with the Triarch long gone, and huge numbers of tomb worlds lying desolate or still dormant, there can be no galaxy-wide coordination, no grand strategy that will bring about Necron Ascendancy. Instead, each world's ruler must fend for themselves, pursuing whatever course they deem most suited to the circumstances. For some, this is the domination of nearby threats and the sowing of terror on alien worlds. For others, it might be the recovery of cultural treasures of the lost Necrontia Empire, the stockpiling of raw strategic materials for campaigns yet to come, or even the surge for an organic species whose bodies might prove to be suitable vessels for their minds, thus finally ending the curse of biotransference. Indeed, this last one matters. The apotheosis from undying machine back to living being is the key motivating factor for many Necron nobles and royals, for its possibility weighed heavily on the Silent King's mind at the moment of his final command. Well, all this is further complicated by the fact that the departure of the Silent King and the dissolution of the Necrontier Empire's Triarch left no clear succession. As a result, the rulers of many tomb worlds see an opportunity not only to restore the dynasties of old, but also to improve their standing within the galaxy-wide Necron political hierarchy. The motives of the nobles and royals are often muddied by the pursuit of personal power, making accurate divination of an individual's intentions, and therefore of the campaigns conducted by their undying legions, nigh impossible. Having slumbered in dusty stasis crypts scattered across the galaxy, they have been slowly awakening, one tomb world at a time, for several millennia. The process is far from stable, however, for the legions have lain immobile and undreaming for 60 million standard years. It is a staggering feat of science that any tomb worlds have survived at all and many have fallen prey to corruption in their arcane systems, planetary upheaval, and the actions of other species, most of them in ignorance, but a few very deliberate indeed. Throughout the long eons of slumber, the world's autonomic systems have worked tirelessly to maintain these vast structures and to defend them against the intrusions of the lesser species of the galaxy. It is not known to the Imperium exactly when the first tomb world initiated its revification protocols, and it is quite possible that some did so in error well before the ordained time. Only now, as more and more awaken, is a pattern becoming visible to those whose mission it is to stand watch upon the trackless reaches of the galaxy and beyond, piecing together scattered accounts of skull-faced reaper machines rising from the dust of dead worlds the length and breadth of the galaxy, the Xenos scholars of the Inquisition are faced with a stark realization. What at first appeared to be unrelated alien raids serving no overall purpose were, in fact, the heralds of a disaster of galactic proportions. Having slept so still and for so long, it is not possible for a tomb world to awaken quickly into a fully alert state. While dormant, 
each is controlled by a master artificial intelligence program that oversees its essential maintenance and defense, mobilizing what resources it judges appropriate to any given situation or threat. As the long-awaited time of awakening nears, as best can be judged by the master program, more of its systems are brought online and more of the interred revived. Often, it is the lower order of Necrons, the Necron warriors and immortals, that are awakened in the initial phases. These nearly mindless automatons, following their lifeless protocols, are brought online first, so that the way might be prepared for the more senior members of the dynasty. As each tier in the Necron dynasty's hierarchy is revived, each more intelligent and bearing more individuality than the last, the whole process gradually begins to appear more like the workings of an ancient civilization and less like that of some great machine. At the allotted time, a Necron Overlord is awakened, and upon his full revival, the Master Program cedes power to its creators. From that point onward, a truly ancient mind leads the tomb world, and what happens next depends entirely upon their character and ambition. Some overlords are cunning and patient, seeking to muster every resource at their disposal before launching the legions into the void to fulfill the destiny of the lost Necron Empire. Others are bellicose and impatient, launching a string of attacks before those other star-faring species settled in the region discover the tomb world's awakening. While most are likely to assault nearby worlds occupied by sapien races, some have been known to offer such worlds an ultimatum. Serve the Necrons or die. The process of awakening presents a massive danger to a tomb world. If anything other than minuscule numbers of Necrons are revived at once, a staggering amount of energy is unleashed, which can be detected within light years and inevitably leads to investigation by ignorant and curious mortal species. Thus should a world awaken to find itself lying near or even beneath the territory of a younger star-faring species, the massive energy spike might draw such attention that it is overwhelmed before its warriors are able to respond. Having been awakened and control turned over to an overlord, the tomb world must, in time, take its place in the domains of the Necron dynasty that created it. While many dynasties have never awakened and, due to a variety of disasters, never will, many are slowly piecing together their former domains. One world at a time, empires that vanished eons ago are being rebuilt and long dormant hierarchies are reasserting themselves once more. At the center of each of these risen empires is a crown world the glorious capital and seat of the Pharaon who rules an entire dynasty. Below it are numerous lesser tomb worlds and other Necron holdings, though rarely are these anywhere near as extensive as they were in their full glory 60 million standard years ago.